All right, that's it for our announcements this morning. Uh, today is a really exciting day. Uh, maybe you felt the buzz, okay? Today is a really exciting day because today is Baptism Sunday. As all of you guys know, there are four individuals who are sitting up here in the front who are getting baptized this morning. And in just a few moments, I'm going to ask them to come up on stage one by one so they can share their testimonies with us. As you guys might expect, if you've ever been in a position to have to share your testimony or if you've ever done any kind of public speaking, I'm sure you guys can imagine how anxious they feel, how nervous they feel about having to speak in front of all of you. And of course, that's totally natural. But in the days and the weeks leading up to this morning service, I have been reminding these four again and again of how eager and excited we all are to be able to hear from them, especially those of us who've had a direct hand in ministering to them and praying for them and sharing the gospel with them. I think in a lot of ways, today's baptism service is not only a demonstration of how God has been so faithful to work in their lives, but it's also an example of how God works through so many of you, the church, brothers and sisters in the Lord, so that these four could be where they are today. And I really do hope that those of you who've had some kind of role, however big or small, uh, would leave here feeling encouraged and humbled and really filled with gratitude, knowing that your labor was not in vain, but that he used your efforts, however imperfect or inadequate they may have felt, to really bear fruit in the lives of these loved ones in front of us. Before our baptism candidates come up to share and testify of God's saving grace in their lives, I just wanted to actually briefly explain the significance and the importance of baptism. Because here's the thing, guys. If we aren't careful, baptism can just become this like empty, meaningless, hollow religious ritual that we do as a church because that's what churches do, right? But according to scripture, baptism is one of the biggest blessings that God has gifted us with in the gospel. In Matthew 28, 18 through 20, a passage that's commonly referred to as a great commission, the risen Christ is appearing before his disciples, and he issues one final command before he ascends into the heavens. And this is what he says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Even if you've never, never read through the Bible before, you'll notice that the main part of that command is simple. It is to make disciples. But what I also want to point out is that baptism is singled out by our Lord as one of the key ways in which disciples are made. In other words, baptism is an essential part of what it means to follow Christ. Over and over again throughout the pages of Scripture, we see that baptism was actually one of the very first things that people would do once they made the decision to follow Jesus. It was their first act of obedience, if you will. For example, in Acts chapter 8, there's this Ethiopian eunuch and. Uh, Philip shares the gospel with him, and immediately afterwards, immediately following his conversion, this eunuch gets baptized. Or in Acts 16, in two separate stories, both Lydia and the Philippian jailer are baptized immediately following their conversion. In Acts chapter 2, when the crowds are asking Peter on the day of Pentecost what they must do to respond to the preaching of the gospel, Peter replies by telling them to repent and to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Even Jesus, our Lord himself, marked the start of his public ministry. He announced officially that he was ready to get underway with his ministry by doing what? By being baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River. This, by the way, is a reason why we here at BMC have always made it a consistent practice to reserve the communion table, the Lord's Supper, for baptized believers. We've gotten so many questions over the years about why we as a church do that. And the reason why is because baptism is logically 
prior to communion. It is theologically prior to communion. Baptism is the beginning ordinance, whereas communion is what's traditionally been referred to as the ongoing ordinance. Perhaps it might help to explain it this way. I want you guys to think of a wedding anniversary. What are wedding anniversaries all about? They are simply a way for married couples to look back on their wedding day. And likewise, whenever we partake in the Lord's Supper, whenever we take communion together as a church, an act, by the way, that Jesus refers to as an act of remembrance. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Communion is our way of looking back at how God cleansed us from our sin and he united us to Christ by faith. Spiritual realities which are uniquely symbolized in the ordinance of baptism. And the parallels, they don't just begin and end there. Because just as wedding ceremonies only happen one time, whereas wedding anniversaries are celebrated again and again, so too baptism is designed to be this thing that takes place one time in a believer's life, ideally at the beginning of a believer's spiritual life. Whereas communion is something that we do repeatedly throughout our Christian lives as followers of Jesus. And therefore, you see, baptism, it's not this exclusive religious ceremony that only serious Christians are supposed to partake in. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, what you'll quickly realize is that an unbaptized Christian is a completely foreign concept in the Bible. There's no such thing. There's no category for an unbaptized Christian because the Bible always assumes that those who have made a commitment to follow Jesus have already professed that decision outwardly by being baptized. My point being this, baptism is for every Christian, period. It's not for just serious Christians or really committed Christians or really mature Christians. It is for every Christian. Because guess what? If you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Christ, you've already been baptized. You've been baptized by the Holy Spirit which means that the next logical step that you are to take as a believer is to give outward expression to that inward reality by stepping into the waters of baptism. So for anyone here in this room who might consider yourself to be a follower of Jesus, but for whatever reason has yet to be baptized, I really want to encourage you guys this morning to take that step of commitment, just like these four are doing this morning. Follow what the Bible teaches. Follow what the Lord tells you to do and respond in obedience to God and his word. If you guys are interested in learning more about what that entails, come talk to me after service. Talk to one of the pastors. The other point that I briefly wanted to make about baptism before our candidates come up here to share is that baptism signifies our union with Christ. Our union with Christ in death and in resurrection. Listen to the words of Romans chapter 6. The Apostle Paul asks, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Here the Apostle Paul explains that baptism demonstrates how Christians have been united to Christ in death, burial, and resurrection. And the reason why this is so important, friends, is because this is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of what we believe. You see, the Bible says that Jesus came to save us from our sins. Yes, he came to be a moral example. Yes, he came to fulfill the law, but his first and foremost primary purpose in coming to earth was to save us from our sins. And the specific way he went about doing so was by taking our sins upon himself and bearing the penalty of death, which is exactly what our sins deserved. See, at the cross, Jesus willingly and voluntarily died for our sake. And whenever, any time a Christian gets baptized, they are symbolizing the fact that when Christ died, they died. When Christ died, they died. 
their old selves, their old ways of thinking, their old values, their old priorities, all of that were crucified with Jesus. So when we go outside in just a few moments, and you notice that baptistry, it's just an inflatable kiddie pool we bought on Amazon for like $15, all right? Nothing special, but I want you to realize that that baptistry is a coffin. It is a burial plot. It is a thing that pictures again that when these four brothers and sisters are submerged into water, their old selves have died. Their old selves have been buried with Christ. But there's good news, because not only is that baptistry a kind of burial plot, if you will, it's also a birthing table as well. Baptism, you see, it doesn't just picture the end of life. It also pictures the start of a new life. A life that, again, Romans chapter 6 refers to as newness of life. It is good news. There is new birth. There is new life being created. Elsewhere in 2 Corinthians 5, the Bible puts it this way, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And make no mistake, we believe that this has already happened. What we're doing with the water is just a symbolic thing. Okay, we believe that the spiritual reality of new birth, new life, new creation is already taking place in the lives of these individuals. But again, we want to give concrete, tangible expression to something that would otherwise be invisible by taking the step of commitment and being baptized in accordance with God's word. And that's why, even in the days and weeks leading up to this morning's service, we have referred to the baptism as a celebration, because that's exactly what it is. Baptism is how we recognize, it is how we commemorate the fact that God has brought about new life. That by his grace, those who were once dead in their trespasses and in their sins have been made alive together with Christ. For when Jesus was raised from the dead, because the gospel doesn't end on Good Friday, right? There's this Easter Sunday, there's this resurrection Sunday in which Jesus was raised to the glory of the Father. Well, so too were all those who have been united to Christ by grace through faith. All that to say, we have so many reasons, guys, to rejoice this morning. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus, I want you to be reminded today, as you witness these baptisms, of how good God is, and how good God continues to be. Because I get it, life is hard, and there's so much broken in the world around us, and it's our tendency, right, as the kind of pessimistic, you know, glass half empty type of people that we tend to be, to fixate and focus on all that's wrong. But the reality is, when you hear stories and when you hear testimonies like the ones that you're about to hear this morning, it has this really powerful way of recalibrating your perspective so that you remember how good and kind and merciful and good God has been to you. And for those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus, and I know that many of you guys are here on the invitation of those who are being baptized, we're glad that you guys came. We're so thankful that you guys are here. But my hope and my prayer for you is that today's service, both the testimonies that you're about to hear as well as the baptisms that will follow afterwards, that they would work together to plant gospel seeds in your heart. That's my prayer. That God would bear fruit, that he would grow those seeds to his glory so that you too might walk in newness of life. It is a good life. Understand what Jesus means when he says, I have come to give life and to give this life abundantly. If you want to partake in the abundant life, again, please come and talk to us after the service is finished. I'm gonna ask for these four brothers and sisters to start making their way backstage, but as they do, let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray together. Father, we are so grateful for this day where we can gather together and worship you, to sing songs of praise, to be reminded, Lord God, from your word of all that you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. We're thankful, Lord God, for these four brothers and sisters, these four individuals in our church family who have been working hard over the last several weeks to prepare their testimonies, to reflect, Lord God, on all the various ways that you've been working in their lives. And as they bear testimony, Lord God, of your grace, 
we pray that they would be able to speak loudly and clearly to the good news of Jesus. Allow us, Lord God, to be eager to receive what they have to share. Calm them and help their anxieties and the nerves, Lord God, that they're feeling to just fade away and to shine the spotlight on Christ. We love you so much, and we pray that you would be honored and glorified today. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time,